It was September 22nd in the year 1862 that President Abraham Lincoln issued what he called the Emancipation Proclamation. And that, of course, announced that all slaves living in the southern states would be free. It did not end slavery because the war went on for another two years or so until it ended 150 years ago this week with the surrender of General Lee at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. And then finally, the slaves were free. The sisters and brothers, it is very appropriate that we reflect upon the Civil War and its end and the freedom of slavery because the Lord at Easter time emancipates a, another group of slaves. And th these slaves are not those that are imprisoned by chains or a ball and chain around their, around their ankles. These slaves are people like you and me. Because all of us experience not physical slavery, but spiritual slavery of one kind or another at different times during our lives. The Lord wants to emancipate the slaves. He wants to free the slaves. He wants to free you and me of anything holding us in bondage, anything enslaving us. Easter is an issuing of a proclamation of freedom for all people that was won for us on the cross. And yet in everybody's life, in everybody's heart, there is a sort of civil war that goes on. There's kind of a tug of war going on in our hearts, two spirits pulling us in one direction or the other. There is a war between the spirits within us, the spirits of darkness and sin, and in opposition, the spirit of freedom, light, and goodness. This uh, first epistle of St. John today puts it this way, and the victory that conquers the world is our faith, who indeed is the victor over the world, but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And so, Christ is the victor over sin and death, and he shares that victory with us over anything that enslaves us when we open our hearts and our minds to him in faith. And so, my sisters and brothers, on this Mercy Sunday, the second Sunday of the Easter season, the Lord is calling us to look into our hearts to see what am I enslaved to? Are there any attitudes in my life that are a form of slavery? I'd like to focus on two attitudes that I believe we need to be freed of, freed by Christ, our victorious King. And I would say those two attitudes that enslave us are, are these. The spirit of an extreme optimism or naiveness and the spirit of an excessive pessimism or negativism. Two extremes that can slave us, enslave us. Extreme optimism or extreme pessimism. So one of my favorite stories is a story about two twins. His mother brought these two twins to the psychiatrist and said, uh, Doctor, these two twins are extremes. One twin is an extreme optimist and the other twin is an extreme pessimist. What do I do? No problem. He said, come with me. And so he put the pessimist in a room with all kinds of beautiful toys. From, from the floor to the ceiling, every toy you could imagine. He put the pessimist in there and shut the door. Went to another room and took the optimist, put him in a room with a pile of manure, closed the door. Said, let's wait 15 or 20 minutes and I'm going to cure your kids of extreme optimism and extreme pessimism. A few minutes passed, the doctor took uh, the mother in the, in the room with the pessimist, opened the room, all the toys. He was sitting in the corner with his arms crossed. What in the world's wrong with you? Look at all these toys. I never get what I want. I don't like these toys. They're the wrong color. The doctor shook his head and couldn't believe he couldn't cure the pessimist. He said, I'll have better luck with the optimist. Went in the room, opened the door, and there was the pile of manure. And the little kid, the little twin, was sitting in the midst of the manure, throwing all the manure up in the air. Hay and manure, having a great time. The doctor said, what in the world are you doing? 
And the optimist said, where there's this much manure, there must be a horse. <laughs> extremes. There are dangers in each extreme spiritually. And excessive optimism is a form of being naive. And we see it really a lot today in extreme optimism. Now, I'm talking about an extreme. There's nothing wrong about being an optim optimist, but extreme or excessive optimism keeps us out of the area of realism. Extreme optimism is an extreme, and it's not realistic. It's the kind of person who says, ah, everything is wonderful, everything is okay. I don't want to look too closely into my life or critique my life. I don't want to look at anything that might be sinful in my life or wrong with my life because I might have to change. So I, I live with rose-colored glasses and I see everything is just wonderful. In the area of morality, we think about it in terms of, well, whatever I think is okay is okay, or someone else, as long as somebody else thinks it's okay and it doesn't quote-unquote hurt somebody, it must be okay. There's no morality. There's no such thing as right or wrong, only what you think or what you feel. There's nothing sinful. There's nothing immoral. There's no sin. There's no standard of right or wrong, good or evil. Everything is just wonderful. I don't want to be a judge of anybody. That is definitely a trap to think that way. Because you're right, in one sense. God does not want us to be a judge of anybody. Who am I to judge means that I have no right to condemn anybody to hell. Only God is the supreme judge of a person's soul. Even the Pope said, who am I to judge? But what he meant by that is that we can't put ourselves in his position, judging people's hearts or souls. But it doesn't mean that we can't judge between right or wrong, good or evil. There is a standard set by God. In fact, that second reading from John put it this way, in this you will know if you love God, and that is if you keep his commandments. In this you will know that you love God if you keep his commandments. That's the word of God. So there is a standard of right and wrong, and that is the, those are the commandments. There is a moral code that keeps us free. People who don't follow a moral code, when people don't follow what God's standard is, there's chaos and there's slavery, spiritual slavery in our hearts. God wants to set us free. We have a right and a duty to judge actions. We have a right and a duty to judge behavior of ourselves and other people. But that doesn't mean you go around beating people over the head with the, with the Bible or being judgmental, but it does mean to recognize and to admit that there is right and there is wrong. There is good and there is evil. And he's the standard of good and evil, right and wrong. Not me. Not you. Not the federal government. Not popular opinion. Not the Des Moines Register. Not City View. He's the, the standard of right and wrong, good or evil. St. Paul says, speak the truth. Christ is the truth, but speak it in love. Call what's right, right. Call what's wrong, wrong. Right is right, even if the whole world thinks it's wrong. Wrong is wrong, even if the whole world thinks it's right. He's the standard. An extreme optimist sees everything through his rose-colored glasses. And on the other hand, the pessimist, the pessimist sees everything as doom and gloom. An optimist who's extreme doesn't need a savior. An extreme optimist doesn't need a savior because everything's just wonderful. Who needs him? There's no sin. Who needs a savior? I've got it made on my own. Slavery. The other extreme is an excessive negativism or being a pessimist. Oh, no one can do anything right. I see bad in everyone. I see bad in everything. The glass is half empty, not half full. 
looking at the downside of everything. Everything is wrong, everything is sinful. Carrot walking around under a dark cloud. When we make a mistake, we feel like it's the end of the world. Oh, I'm no good, a, a rotten wretch. Or if someone else is a sinner, makes a mistake, oh, he's a rotten wretch, we want to destroy him. Destroy the sinner. Destroy the person who does what's wrong. Extreme negativism is a form of slavery. It's usually violent and vile. Excessively negative is doom and gloom. The extreme optimist wears rose-colored glasses. Both are slavery. And God wants to free us. In this gospel story, Jesus appears to the disciples, and Thomas doesn't believe that Jesus is risen from the dead, and finally Jesus comes and says, Look, Thomas, look at my wounds. Blessed are those who do not see yet believe. Blessed are those who do not see yet believe. And that goes for morality. That goes for truth. Blessed are those who don't always see the logic behind some moral principles or some of the teachings of Christ. Oh, I can't understand why the Lord says do not commit adultery or why there's certain things that are immoral. I don't understand it, therefore I don't believe it. But the Christian says, I don't need to understand it. I only need to believe that if he says it's so, it must be so. If he says all life is sacred from womb to tomb, I may not always understand it, but I believe it because if he says it's so, it must be so. If he says marriage is between a man and a woman for life, I may not understand it, but if he says it's so, it must be so. I believe it. Do you? We cannot twist God's truth to conform to our twisted way of thinking. We need to humbly come and recognize that it's you, O Christ, who sit on the throne of my life. It's not I who sit there. He knows what is true. He knows what is good. He knows the way to salvation. He knows the pathway to peace. He knows also what enslaves us. And what enslaves us is an extreme optimism and an excessive negativism. Both are wrong. What counts is a realism, and that's what's real. He's what's real. A lot of this other thing, these other things and attitudes are a mirage. Christ wants peace in our hearts. He came as a father, as a Lord of mercy, and you see the icon here, image of Christ with blood and water radiating, pulsating from his heart. He wants to wash us clean with the wa waters of his love and mercy. He wants to redeem us by his precious blood. He wants to free us from the slavery that binds us and confuses us, keeps us in darkness. Reality is in Christ, not in my viewpoints. And simply because it's legal does not make it moral. He is the truth. Get off the throne. And I have to get off the throne too. And let him occupy the throne of my heart. God never gives up on us, and that's the message of mercy. God never gives up on us. He never gives up on the sinner. He never gives up on any of us. He never gives up even when we're enslaved. He's always here to lift us up. Listen. He never wants to put you down. He wants to always lift you up. But he can't lift you up unless you recognize how down you already are. He can't free you unless you recognize that to some degree you're in slavery. In 1920s, a nun by the name of Faustina had visions of Jesus. And he came to announce to her again his Emancipation Proclamation. 
the victory that he won on the cross. And he said to Mother, to Saint Faustina that he wants all of us to come to him, to be empowered to have a victory over whatever is dark and wrong and enslaving in our lives. And the Pope put it this way recently. Pope Francis said this. He says, we must prepare ourselves for a spiritual combat. Prepare yourself for a spiritual battle, the Pope says. This is important, he says. It is impossible to preach the gospel without this spiritual battle, a daily battle against sadness, against bitterness, against pessimism, a daily battle. And Jesus wants to win the victory. But I have to open my heart and turn to him. Jesus said to St. Faustina, when you feel discouraged, he says, when you feel discouraged and you want to run, do not run away, but run and hide in my heart. I like that. Jesus said, don't run away when you're discouraged. Run to me and hide in my heart. You see, his heart is open. To hide in this heart, imagine ourselves coming into the heart of Christ and being secure there and being at peace there. St. Faustina offered a beautiful prayer during one of the visions she had of the Jesus of mercy. I'd like to offer that prayer today because I need freedom from my own spiritual slavery. And if you're like me, you do too. So if you will, kneel with me before this icon image of our Lord of mercy and pray for the freedom from slavery that he alone can bring us. O oh, Jesus, source of life, sanctify me. O oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, my strength, fortify me. O oh, Jesus, my commander, fight for me. O oh, Jesus, my light, enlighten me. Jesus, my master, guide me. I entrust myself to you. As a little child entrusts himself to his mother's love, as a little child entrusts to his mother's love, even if all things were to conspire against me, even if all things were to conspire against me, and even if the ground were to give way under my feet, and even if the ground were to give way under my feet, Jesus, I would be at peace close to your heart. Jesus, Jesus, you are always most tender to me. Jesus, you understand me. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Amen.